I'm Dr. Greg Winteregg, CEO of the Private Dentist Alliance. I want to talk to all of you students out there today who are wondering what your future is going to be like as a career in dentistry, as an assistant, as a hygienist, as a dentist, where is this profession going with the rapid increase of the DSO movement? I'm here to tell you the PDA is going to help you and I want you to become a member today. It is free. Now, why should you become a member? You're gonna get weekly video updates from me and you're gonna get regular updates of our newsletters from the Alliance on exactly what is happening and how we are going to help preserve and protect the private practice of dentistry. Now, to me, the most important advantage is you are going to get access to our job board. What is that? Our private practicing members all have access to our PDA job board, which means if they have an opening in their private practice of assistant, hygienist, doctor, front office staff, they're going to be able to post it. And you're gonna be able to check up regularly. And as our membership grows, we're gonna be covering larger and larger territories across the United States. If you are looking for a job in any position in the office of a private practice, you need to become a student member today. It is free. Go to www.privatedental.org and become a student member today. You're going to love your benefits. Do it now. What is up, guys? It's your boy, Matt Havis, back here again with the Dental Student Vibes Podcast. And today we have an awesome, awesome interview for you. We have Dr. David Maloli. He is the co-author of Titans of Dentistry, an awesome book. You guys should definitely check that out. It gives a lot of insight to successful interviews of, of other dentists that have accomplished great things. So you definitely want to check that out. But Dr. David Maloli is going to sit down with us today and discuss all things related to building yourself up, using the psychology lessons that he's learned and everything in order to become the best person that you could possibly be to help lead your team in your dental practice and how to build yourself up for yourself as a practitioner, for your patients, and personally in your life with your family, friends, whoever, just to be the best person you could possibly be. Truly, truly awesome interview. This is the first of two parts of the interview series we're going to have with him. And later this week, we'll post the other interview. So check it out. Follow us on Instagram at dental.student.vibes. Let us know what you think. It's an awesome interview. We love hearing your feedback. And, you know, in these crazy times, let's stay safe and vibe on. All right. So we have a very special guest with us today, Dr. David Maloli. I also have Matt. Hey guys. Hey guys. <laughs> so Dr. David Maloli, he has got his hand into everything. He's got one of the best books I've ever read. Honestly, I think this is my favorite dental book. Titans of Dentistry. Dr. Dave is the Titan of Dentistry. Dr. Dave, how are you today? I'm awesome. Thanks for uh, having me. I enjoy um, kind of robust and candid conversations. Thanks for the compliment on the book. But um, as you know, it's like, it's hard to put your name as the author when there was so much submitted by so many heroes of mine. So it was it was fun to put together a, a group effort there. And really, I hope it hopes, helps you at your stage of your career see the infinite path to success and that you can really define it on your own terms. And you can do what I did and pivot multiple times throughout a career. So I still think and there's a lot of naysayers in dentistry, but um, I can't think of a career that offers more. So uh, excited to see where the conversations go and where you guys go as professionals. Yeah, absolutely. So Dr. Dave, I mean, like you said, there's so many opportunities. You've got Relentless Dentist and that's huge. Can you tell everybody a little bit more about Relentless Dentist? I mean, you got a huge podcast, listen to it all the time. Yeah. Um, well, it, it was a strange entry point. Um, I started, I stumbled across, across the podcast um, and it was Entrepreneur on Fire, and it was with uh, Barbara Corcoran, who's one of the sharks on Shark Tank. And I was like, wow, like immediately I knew it was going to be like this incredible thing. And so this was probably 2012. Um, that host of that show, uh, John Lee Dumas, became my mentor. And the only reason that I had to start a podcast is the podcast that I wanted wasn't available to... Um, I was always taught that an entrepreneur provides 
solves a solution for themselves by solving a solution for other people that have that same need. And I was really into fear and courage and reading about that. Uh, the book I was reading, I remember at the time, it's kind of an obscure book, but I still think it's incredible. It's called Flinch. It's talking about what you do and how to lean into fear. And then the quote at the bottom of my um, dental town page, we were talking offline about Howard, was the thing that you need to fear is usually the thing that you most need to do. And um, I was I'm painfully shy most of my life. Reaching out to my heroes was the scariest thing I could think of. But I knew podcasting was going to be a tidal wave type media source. And so I just jumped in. And pitching those first guests, I had to explain what a podcast was, what we were going to do, how we were going to connect via Skype. And I'm not very tech savvy, but um, John Lee Dumas kind of guided me through the initial, initial stages, and I just jumped in without really understanding the tech. Um, my, my conversations were hyper scripted, and I found like a lot of guests wanted that because dentists like to know the answers before the test, before the test, yeah. um, as fact finding people. And so I just really kind of dove in without an agenda just to see what would happen. Um, and what happened was amazing. I mean, most of the best friends I have in dentistry or really outside of dentistry have come directly or indirectly from podcasts. Just, it gives you kind of a media pass. You get to reach out to people that normally wouldn't give you the time of day and say, hey, listen, I'd like to feature you on my show. So um, I think that's kind of how life is. Like you kind of just jump into things and you really don't know what's in store until much later. Uh, dentistry has been, been like that very much for me. My army career was, my associateship was, my scratch start was. Um, so I think that's, that's, I mean, that's the theme is, kind of courageous and bold moves and making sure that your career moves along and that you don't become this risk averse static clinician and hope that that will get you all that you had hoped the, the career would provide for you. Right. That's, that's, that's fantastic. And I love what you said, leaning into fear. I really like that phrase. Um, I bet you are probably a big Goggins fan because he's all about doing what you don't want to do. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think, I think, Courage is this overstated, this thing, because we see these heroic, big, bold moves, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, all these sorts of things. But when you run a business, when you're a clinician, like every single decision can be boiled down to a step forward into courage or back into comfort. So once you understand that game and you just have to train your mind to say, fear means that I move forward, not that I don't retreat. And you have all see those opportunities to, you know, tell a, a patient who doesn't want to hear they need a crown, tell them they need a crown. Those little maneuvers, those little methods stack up and you start to develop it like a muscle. And it's interesting, like you, you can probably appreciate um, thus far in your dental journey that clin clinical dentistry doesn't reward bold moves. They reward tried and true systems. So what you're rewarded to, for as a clinician sometimes gets in the way of practice success, life success. So you have to appreciate that you're kind of taking off hats and putting on different ones, depending on the role that you serve and the patient or the team member or uh, family member that you're facing. And so that's the, what I see as the big challenge in dentistry is that a lot of our colleagues spend so much time trying to help and please and serve that they kind of lose their own identity. So um, that's, you know, kind of a warning to dental students is really, you don't have to be crystal clear on your path because man, we're in like hyper evolution. Like it, dentistry, as we know, it will be much different in 10 years, but you have to have some idea of what you want, what you want, or specifically what you don't want clinically, the types of patients that you want to see the procedure mix, the type of team environment. Cause if you don't, the default usually isn't that, you know, it's, it makes for a miserable career and, and, you don't have to look very far to find a, a colleague who's really kind of suffering, even though all of the opportunities that we talked about in the beginning are available to them as well. Right. Um, I think what you said is it's so key how dentistry is changing like crazy. I mean, today we had to go in and get fitted for our N95 mask. So we got N95 on, then another mask on top of that. And then, you know, you can imagine all the rest of the PPE. Soon we'll be wearing the hazmat suits. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Right? 
But um, and you have to build rapport. You know what I mean? Like you still have to connect to the patient. So exactly. now we've got several layers, several barriers that aren't artificial on a on a patient who might already be scared. So yeah, the challenges continue to stack, right? Right. And it, 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 you, like, like you were saying there, it is so difficult to, you know, wear the PPE, but then get on like a human level with the patient because yeah. patients, you, you know, even if you're not in, you're just in your scrubs and you're just talking to the patient pre COVID, they're already scared of you. You know, like, Oh my God, I'm here at the dentist. But mm -hmm. once you start throwing on layers and stuff, I put a glove on the patient's ready to leave. Like, All right, I, yeah. this is too much. <laughs> so you throw on two masks, your loops, you know, your face shield and everything, at least for our school and your gown, they're ready to, you know, book it, you know, they're, they're getting defensive. So it's hard on case acceptance. I've seen it already. You know, we're not even doing aerosol procedures right now. So just trying to get them to show for their second appointment is a struggle. Yeah. I mean, that's that most dentists come in as highly compassionate people that want to serve golden hearted, I would say. And um, it's hard when you have to take on that empathy, sometimes that fear that that psyche of the, the patient, we can't help but absorb that. Like, 20 years and you know getting into dentistry getting through school different um, types of careers that I've had like still a mandibular block block on a anxious patient is difficult because if if you give a damn then you absorb some of that and you do that several times a day on top of you know one star review on a bad day or a team member that decides at the last minute that it, that they can't make it to work like you have to be really mentally agile. You have to be really anti-fragile. And a lot of those things we aren't taught. And so um, my encouragement to kind of develop those skill sets and start stacking skills because clinical dentistry will get you a license, but it won't give you the career that most dentists being ambitious people in the first place really aspire to. Right. So how would you say like, um, while we're in school right now, that we could build that mental toughness. Is there is there anything like either in school, outside of school, anything like that that you would recommend? Um, the easiest way is physical. Um, I, I do, I just call it schedule suffering. Like I, I'd rather be proactive about my suffering and build some resilience than um, I've certainly got my butt kicked multiple times as, as a reactive measure. Um, and now I'm, I'm building myself up emotionally, physically, spiritually, because I know another rainy day is coming or worse yet, a thunderstorm that lasts for two or three years. So, um, that's the obvious one. It's available to, to everyone. It could be a run. It could be burpees in the morning. Um, but the thing that I think really gets missed is that we are our habits, right? And I, I spend a lot of my coaching focused on habits and I think of systems in a business as habits for the organization. And the resilience is one thing, but making sure that you have the skill set so that when you encounter a difficult team member, a difficult patient, even business challenges, that you, you feel like you've seen this before or heard about it before. Because if not, like you can appreciate when you first go to clinic, like everything is a conscious effort. And you want some of that to be subconscious because then you can make wise decisions. But if you come in at it from like a, a reactive fight or flight standpoint, usually the, it's very easy to make the wrong decision. It's usually a, a, a timid decision. It's usually a scarce decision. So just making sure that you have some fundamental knowledge on if you want to be a, a, a practice owner and want that autonomy, I encourage that. I mean, I really believe that's one of the coolest things about dentistry is that you can heal, you can give people's confidence, you can create an amazing culture place to work that's that's not available but that's not for everyone i appreciate that but if you are going to own a practice you have to realize that clinician probably isn't your number one role it's employer it's team right. builder it's it's marketer it's um cfo cmo like all these roles if you deny that then you get hurt you get hurt because the bank doesn't care the bank doesn't care that you'd rather do it right so um just developing those skill sets and usually when when young dentists or you know pre-dental pre-dental students or dental students I encounter them I just say get on a steady diet and they say like what's the best book and I'm like I can't give you the best book because it's a stack of you know what I mean it's you, what's you that gotta, you gotta go with titans of dentistry you got I mean that's a good summary like that's, that's a fire hose for sure and and um if you're gonna read that I would say you know take your time and highlight it and take your insights 
it's not it's not meant to be read front to back and so um there's tons of insights there because it's super distilled right but there you know business acumen leadership acumen there's people that have been there and done that and if you understand human psychology you're immediately a better leader you're immediately a better parent you're immediately a better employer uh, just by understanding how people work or how they what brings out the worst on and what, what what tends to bring out the worst in people and engineer away from that in your in your practice right so um how would you say that we can start preparing for the the business acumen and all that sort of stuff i'll give you two scenarios here it's a, it's a two-on-one question so right now matt and i are uh d3s right okay. got another year to go and we've already started like building protocols and all of that sort of stuff in clinic We've got systems written now. We got systems for the podcast, you know, okay. we're really focusing on how can we do stuff now and bring it all these systems later on. So then also we've got a lot of friends that just graduated, just got their licenses, just got the DAA license today. Right. And what can they do? Cause now they don't get the, uh, you know, CE student discount, all that sort of stuff. So they're a little bit more hesitant to just jump right in like versus us. So we're right. so, Dental students and then new grads. I mean, I think it all goes to clarity because there's so many paths. And so it sounds like you have an entrepreneurial lean and are preparing for that acquisition or startup. And so you have to first know your outcome. And when, when, when we, in coaching training, whether it be executive coaching training, coaching of any sort, it says like, well, it depends on your outcome, right? Um, because what's good for me as somebody who wants more of a lifestyle practice might not be good for you who wants to get to five practices as quickly as possible and, and, you know, bundle them up with shared services and that sort of thing. So um, it really depends on where you're going. Um, I think it's an Alice in Wonderland when the, where the, the cat says like, um, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will get you there. Right. And I see that as a big problem in dentistry, because if you don't decide what your journey looks like, the default is more is better and money equals success. So I guess my advice for both parties would be avoid that as the default. I'm not, I'm not against money at all, but if that money also, the, the psychology of money is that it's a narcotic, you need a, a, a bigger and bigger hit to get the fix, so to speak. So if that's the goal, the horizon just keeps eluding you and you keep getting more and more frustrated because you get to a million and it's not what you thought it was like, well, maybe it's a million and a half. Well, no, it wasn't there. And so you have to be really careful to make sure that you look at the full package. What do you want for a life? What do you want for a career to support that life? Do you want free time or do you want to be heads down until your kids are five so that you can go travel and go fishing with them or whatever it may be? So in both parties, and the thing that I see again and again is that dentists, if I ask them a simple question, what do you want? They don't know what the answer is. And that's a problem. Right. Cause I don't, I can't get you to Chicago with a roadmap to LA and um, really starting to define that. And now that changes, right? Cause your circumstances will change and you'll get surprised and this, that, and everything. But having like a three to five year window of like, I know that my first goal is to pay off debt okay. and then making sure that you're engineered for that because it's dentists are easy to market to because we are naive about a lot of things that, and we usually have cash flow, so we can pay for, we can we can overcome some of our ignorance with with a with a check, right? And and um, vendors know that, and so it's easy to be a vendor who overcharges and undervalues, underserves, unless you have a dentist customer who's very clear on their outcomes. And if you become very clear, and they see I can't snow that, then you tend to get the best support system and the vendor. So. Uh, that's a really long-winded answer, but the short answer is like you get clear and realize that ain't going to happen in a weekend. Like it, it is, it is the things I thought I would have died for five years ago. I don't care about now. Yeah. So you can constantly revising that through meditation, journaling, whatever works for you. For me, like I've gotten into running and like the strokes of insight that hit me when I'm just out on the road, running up a mountain, like they're, they're, they feel like so pure and so on target uh, and you can't do that in a chaotic day. Like you have to sit, you have to block time, thinking time, so to speak, to make sure that you're not getting further and further from your destination. Because if you're off target and you accelerate, it's the worst thing you can do because sooner or later it becomes almost uncorrectable. 
because you're overextended on loans for commercial real estate or practices or whatever it may be. And then you realize like, that's not what I wanted at all. Like that's a really dangerous game that I see a lot of dentists getting into. And so it's, it's really making sure that, and that's why we designed the book that way is like, make sure that you're living a life true to yourself. And what does that mean? I don't know. It's different for every person. So um, it, it's, it's, you have to go inward, right? Um, otherwise you try and fill the void with external and that's, why you see so many dentists hurting. It might be psychological, it might be substance abuse, it might be financial, it might be in the home, but it usually starts with somebody who doesn't know who they are, therefore they can't be true to themselves, and then they go on this spiral of trying to be everything to everyone, or chasing money or some other target that, that um, doesn't really serve a life well lived. Right, very nice. Now, Dr. Dave, when, you come, when, when, when you're evaluating who you are and what you want, do you do this like every year or two or do you do this every like five years just because, you know, we're humans, we're dynamic, we change. Yeah. So what do you, what, what do you recommend in terms of like what I want now at 25 years old as a third year student is going to be way different than what I want at 27 or 30 or 35, you know, like, so can you give insight on what you uh, would recommend on when to evaluate yourself and your situation? I think the time span gets shorter and shorter because in the information age, things accelerate so fast, you know, like now I see young dentists just a few years out of school, they get into 3d printing and all of a sudden, like they're speaking, like that never would have happened 15 years ago. It just wouldn't have happened. You had to have some gray hairs and some authority and been around the block a time or two, but the internet uh, platforms like this take out the gatekeepers. And so it's the wild west, right? Um, can you, can you repeat the question? I got a little tangential. <laughs> I was just asking, like, how, how often do you think... The process. The process of when you should evaluate yourself and what you want and everything. Uh, I think it's almost daily. Like, yeah. evaluating, did I have a good day? And I think you can boil that. I spend a lot of time studying humans. Like, what are the regrets of the dying? What makes people come alive? What, what is a life fulfilled or a life full of regret? All of those things I think about all the time. It's just how my... My brain has worked. I'd rather listen to a psychology podcast than almost anything because understanding how my brain works and how other brains work uh, is really important. I would say what tends to work, it, it, when I was a senior in undergrad, people was like, so what's your, uh, at the bar, that was the sexy question. What's your five-year plan? Like, I would say a five-year plan is dangerous right now. But what I would do is go macro saying like at the end of my days, what do I wanna make sure that I did do or didn't do? Is it see the world? Well, don't freaking wait until you're 70 years old because you might not have the energy to travel the world, right? Um, is it um, retire early? Well, then you have to start early, right? You have to, or is a retirement even a thing? Do you wanna be fruitful and productive your entire life? So the, the most powerful exercise and the one that got me into dental school and has driven me ever since it's a simple eulogy exercise. Like think about what you would want a family member, a friend and a colleague to say about you at the end. And when I did that, it scared me straight because I knew it wasn't that he stayed up late, drank a lot of beer and ate a lot of pizza. And that's what I was doing in undergrad. Right. So I knew that like I had to figure my shit out or else I, I was going to be back in my hometown working at my dad's store. And then I would be the heir apparent to a rental store in Lexington, Nebraska. And that's not what I wanted. So I had to go, I didn't know what my destination was. And it changes to degrees, but there's certain things you wanna make sure you engineer against. Like my dad had a heart attack at 42. I'm 45, I don't want to be in the discussion of a heart attack ever. So I take care of my health through that frame, right? The other is micro. Micro is like, what is an excellent day? Like what are the things that I wanna make sure that I do? And then you start stacking those as habits. Um, and you can go a year or two, like I do about a full day, right, between Christmas and New Year's typically to make sure that my blueprint is still on target. And it does change. Like literally the things that I thought were top of mind will sometimes be erased from the list before I get there. It just becomes irrelevant. Other thing priorities come up. Um, like for me, the shift was when I became a father. Like immediately some of the selfish wants turned into be an excellent father. So after I'm gone, that Bennett has a roadmap to succeed, to live a life well lived. So 
it's different for everyone. I think, you know, when I look at like the micro micro, you can't go wrong with exercise, meditation, and then journaling. If you just purge, the worst that comes out is all the thoughts that like toxify your brain. At best, you'll have some insights here like, oh, I never thought of it like that. Like maybe I don't want this. But just having time to pause and reflect is really important because in a society that's noisy, they media wants to pull you in different directions. They want to sell you stuff. They want to bring you to their side. And that is very uh, available in dentistry unless you say like, no, unless you know, like you have a filter. Does this get me closer or further away from my outcome? Well, if you don't know, then you're easy to sell to. And you can like, for me, like, I'm not a tech person. I got sold a $129,000 comb beam and I never really even learned how to use it, right? Yeah. That was me thinking like I was gonna be the implant guy. Did I sit down and really think about it? To a degree, but not, you know, I, I didn't act like I was buying a Lambo. I, I just bought it and knew that I would get an ROI and I did, but that wasn't the highest and best use of my money at the time. And that's because I didn't take my CEO time. I didn't take my personal time to really just get clear. So. It's carving out time to make sure that you're not getting lured in and enticed into someone else's vision and version of success. Gotcha. Very nice. <laughs> that, I've never heard somebody compare the comb beam to uh, a <laughs> Lambo. <don't> <laughs> it really <laughs> is. I should have bought the Lambo. <laughs> <laughs> I should have bought the Lambo. Yeah. Okay. So, um, wow. I, I, I got to pick all that apart. So one of the things you mentioned, and I want people to kind of understand this better uh, because most most students um, our age are either like, okay, I'm going to become an associate or, okay, I'm going to buy five practices and have five practices within five years. Like, I'll be honest with you. I, I kind of feel that way. Like, I, I just want to get there. I want to do all these things. But can you explain more about what the lifestyle practice is? Um, somebody early on taught me there's two types of entrepreneurs. And then you have a third a category in dentistry that has no desire to own or employ, right? Um, a achievement entrepreneur is somebody who tends to look at the scoreboard first. I would say a lifestyle entrepreneur tends to go for a feeling. Um, and there's, you know, everything is a spectrum. So you might lean towards one or the other. I can tell you that I was a hardcore achievement entrepreneur. I was going to bring in, um, but I live in a resort, right? So I didn't know who I was. I, I, I built a, a vacation in my backyard. That's why I picked this location so I could ski and fish and bike. And I wasn't doing any of that because my wiring said, build, 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 build. And I became a really savvy marketer. I knew how to get patients in the door. Then I was taking out ads for my first associate long before I had really had the revenue to make it happen. Like I was always one step ahead of myself. And if you're wired that way, and a lot of us are because we are achievement-oriented people, um, then I, there's nothing wrong with that. But the thing I will say is that if, if building is the driver, that's different than chasing money. Because again, money, the psychology of money is interesting because after a certain lifestyle, we tend to just want little upticks. That makes us feel good. So as long as your, your, your bottom line is growing, your psyche is good because you're like, I'm making progress and humans like to grow. Any human likes to grow. Um, but building and DSOing and all this sort of stuff, like I'm glad those people are out there. Um, but my shift happened when I had a wake up call. My wife was a medevac twice in three years to save her life. And I realized like my son, my time with my son, that window closes really quick. quick. He was zero and now he's 10 and in five years if he's anything like me he's not going to want anything to do with me so i wanted to dial it back and i'll probably dial it way back up when he's in college or active and driving you know um driving my car all over the place or whatever it is so i got really intentional about not getting on a delayed life plan and now i don't want to retire i'm looking for a sustainable game that blurs the lines between work and play and so that's what i would consider the lifestyle practice once I re reached some revenue benchmarks that could provide me everything that I wanted travel then I started harvesting off more time that that was but the thing was the interesting thing was is that 
we are, we are scripted as dentists to think time and effort is what pays the bills. And it's not because when I went from four days to three days, my practice had the biggest surge. Like we grew like crazy that year. And that's because I came in so fresh. Like I wasn't, it, what it told me is that I was 80% for four days, but I was a hundred percent for three days or, you know, some, some variation. I'm using that as a metaphor. So, um, so did it's you, really like, how do you, how do you feel rewarded? Right. So did you change anything else just besides the time? Did you take on an associate when you went to three days? What, what else uh, changed besides that? And, and did you uh, make that extra day your CEO time? Is that what changed? Yep, exactly. I, I doubled down on working on the business and working with the team. So strong meeting structure, um, team meetings with training, one-on-one -on -one meetings to really get, clear, get them clear and focused. But if I were going to put it all in one package at all, it's when I shifted from leaders develop followers to leaders develop fellow leaders. We define people's zones. I made them the CEO of that. I but let them be very clear. Like I need you to be, have autonomy here. I need to do things that require dental license and things that are high level executive decisions, everything else somebody else can do. And so it needs its place. So we set up roles and goals and you had to own the zone. And if there was a sensor broken down, I didn't want to hear about it unless it costs over a certain dollar figure that kind of put it in the CEO thing. So we became really efficient and effective just by understanding what makes people come alive. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like um, you transitioned to more, uh, like you said, autonomy for the team. And then also you got your systems in place more. Would you agree with that? Yeah, they were really, they were really, we were really solid before that. But what happens when you do that and you make an abrupt change to the organization, like you realize where the holes in the bucket were that you didn't realize. So you, it's kind of like this forced efficiency. Like we might've had two open chair hours a day by people who canceled and no-showed. Like what do we do to plug that up? And so it, it was just, it, it shines a light on opportunities that were right under your nose all along because the one thing I wasn't going to do is take a pay cut. So <laughs> I was motivated to work less and get paid more um, because that achiever in me says you can make more every single year. And I've done that for over a decade, but you have to get smarter and smarter because I'm not willing to work harder and harder. Right. And that, Does that, that makes sense. Goes into, yeah, definitely. That goes into the lifestyle. Exactly. So um, you also mentioned uh, about your son. So I'm kind of thinking, I know a lot of students that are just getting married, that just graduated, or they're having kids soon, all of that sort of stuff. Um, how did having your son and having your son grow up and you want to spend more time with them, how does that, how has that affected how you practice? And like, how, how has that kind of changed your life in terms of where you allocate your time? Like your shift in entre entrepreneurial shift, like what you were talking about from achievement to a uh, lifestyle. Um, on so many ways. Like I, once I, I, we weren't planning to have Bennett. I had no money and I had no patience. Like we moved here kind of on a, on a dream move. Like it was a bold, we're talking about courage. Like it was a bold move. Um, flirting with stupid move, right? 2009, crappy economy, all these sorts of things. Oh, wow. But the thing that happened when Bennett was born is that, I knew that parenting had little to do with what I said and had everything to do with what I did. And so I knew that I was always role modeling. And those first years were really tricky. Like it, I didn't know if we were gonna make it, like it, it was tight, um, but I kept betting on myself and I'd get high level CE and I'd pack my team on a plane and we'd go over and I'd like keep betting and betting and betting and putting all the chips in. But it's like, I, I wasn't going to fail. I wasn't going to fail. I, I mean, I, I remember like literally trembling and looking at him in the crib saying, Bennett, and I mean, he didn't hear me. He was asleep, but it was a promise saying like, I don't know how I'm going to make this work, but I'm going to figure out a way. And later on when he was old enough, I was, I was teaching him this phrase that Maloli's never give up. And there were times like after my wife had her stroke that I was like, maybe I'll just sell this thing and I'll go be an associate. I'll check out for a couple of years, pay the bills. And then I'll come back with a vengeance when I've had a chance to kind of lick my wounds. And that would have not been 
that would have not been congruent with what I told him. So there's the purpose piece. Um, there's the role modeling piece. Like, I think there's nothing greater than an entrepreneur because we go from nothing, an idea, and we make it something substantial, right? And so I can always tell him, like, you may not have enough resources, but you can be resourceful always. Right. So that really like woke me up to know that there was a spectator along the right way here. And I could live with some really lean months where the credit card bill was more than I wanted to, you know, more than I wanted to ditch out. I, I maxed out three credit cards. I, I cashed into retirement savings all to make it work. But what I couldn't do is having this 10 year old that I ski with now 40 days a year in Denver, in the city saying, dad, tell me about the days when we lived in Vail. Like I didn't want that. So this is called designing your future self. Like I, I knew that, like what I told you in college about, you know, wake up call of, of planning your eulogy, that if I didn't do things in a certain way and do whatever it took and learn marketing to make the phone ring, that was going to be my five year plan yeah. <laughs> was, was, was like a crash and burn. So, um, I think, I mean, to answer your question, it all goes down to the why. Like, I, I'm a nerd about psychology. I, I know the psychology of money. I know that people are far happier spending their money on experiences versus things. And so we don't buy much, but we take really kind of cool, awesome, with lots of surprises, vacations. We're heading out on one tomorrow. I engineered that into the program, and I stopped seeing that as an expense where, like, I can't afford to go as – an investment in me, an invest in my family, allowed me to celebrate my wins from the last quarter. It allowed me to recharge and use it as not the finish line for last quarter, but the ramp up for next quarter because I wasn't going to get tired. Energy Managing my energy became really important. And so I always had kind of a reward system built in there, but it was really, I don't think I would have done it if it wasn't for him. I would have just kept my heads down, head down because I grew up on a farm and that's all we did is work that's all that was celebrated. I mean, if you took vacations like I took or had a hobby for God's sake, like you were considered apathetic and lazy and unfocused. And so um, a lot of that was rewired in me. I lived four years in Europe in the military and in Italy, like they're in no hurry, right? <laughs> so you learn to celebrate life. You learn to sit down and have a bottle of wine and, and savor life there. And I, 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 I like my work ethic and I also like to celebrate life and the, the having a child for me gave me perfect reason to make sure it was all on the schedule and that it was all well executed and very intentional along the way. Wow. I'll tell you one thing, Maloli's never give up. That is way better than Game of Thrones. Uh, Lannister is always paid that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they should have used for that show. <laughs> I love the uh, balance that you have though, Doc Dave, about how you, you know, you work hard, but then you play hard. You yeah. know, it's, it's very inspirational for, you know, young guys where, it shows that you can do it. You don't, you don't have to be all gas, no breaks, where you invest in yourself by taking your vacations and whatnot. We were talking to uh, Dr. Brady Frank, and he was like three vacations in a row within a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. He's like, this is two of three. Tomorrow we ship out to the Bahamas or <laughs> He's something. leaving one vacation to go to the next vacation. I'm like, did you pack enough clothes for this? Like, this is incredible, you know? So, yeah. I mean, seeing this, it's like, it's definitely – you know, it gives us insight of where we want to be and it, it provides us with the, the clarity where, I mean, it's, I, I've never really seen anyone outside of like a psychologist that has, you know, the intellect that you do about the mental psyche and like the human psyche and everything. Like, how did you get all the, like that intellect? Like, where did you learn all this wisdom? You know, like podcasts, anything, books, did you major in it in undergrad? I, th I think I naturally get bored and I'm very curious. And so I'm always kind of stacking habits and skills. And, um, and then I realized like how um, beneficial that was because if you're a one trick pony, like it's easy to knock you off your game. Right. Um, but if you start stacking skills, I call it the polymath principle, like being a clinician, pretty replaceable, being a clinician that can market a little harder to replace So being a clinician that can create a great patient experience and market. And all of a sudden you become this like, I use the Cirque du Soleil thing. Like, I don't even know what that is. Is it circus? Is it music? Is it like, what is that? Right. But because there's now you're so, you have so many layers and so dimensions. Like I never really cared what happened to the economy because I could, I could pivot so quickly. I was agile. 
Um, so I have a natural curiosity, but the thing that really drives it, and I, don't, I can't explain why, is that I've always been fascinated in what makes great people great at the, at, the, at the finest ingredients. And so I read a lot of biographies, and when I was hurting, like in 2014, and like we were teaching my wife to speak and walk again, uh, my team had a mutiny because I was distracted at home and I wasn't a good leader. I was kind of a tyrant at work. I was just like, why do I always feel like I'm playing at 40%, 50%, 60%? Like what would have, have to happen to make me like feel like I can, my, my phrase now in coaching is engineer my best year every single year. So consistently leveling up. And so I studied the best. And I realized that a lot of the best stuff is just kind of bullshit theory. And so I got into the research and the science so that you can take this path anywhere you want to go, right? You can, you, it's human nature. And the more I understood about that, the more I came alive, the more I realized that the leader is always the lid in the organization. The leader takes on the personality. And so if I came to work with more energy, I was role modeling and they did the same. And then I understood the science of, what creates great teams, what creates culture. It's all available. That's the thing about the information age is like, ignorance is a choice and distraction is a choice, but there's also a ton of fluff and nonsense there that doesn't get you clear. So I wanted to know like, if I wanted to be Usain Bolt, what would, what would, I, what would my training regimen be that doesn't look like sprinting? If I wanted to be Steve Jobs, what, what are the ingredients at the finest things that made him come alive and some of these guys are like diabolical like they're you don't want to take on all of it but you want to take the things that serve you and I still am so into that um, because the more I understand about my psyche the more I can be a better parent the more I can influence with integrity the better coach I am and that to me that's the game like there's if there's if I were to you know bless upon you two things for for an incredible career depending on when you're going, the two things are that you're constantly growing and that you're constantly serving. The, the trick is that if you're constantly growing, your capacities and capabilities and confidence are always increasing. So the serving gets almost easier. It becomes like this natural byproduct and you're just constantly giving away insights and information. And to me, that's what I saw in my team. And now that I'm not doing dentistry, like that's what I see in my clients is like, you cannot start unlocking these things of like, no, just do this. So try this. And it's stuff that's not taught. But if you can put that in a nice blueprint and use it as a customizable process, because that's what coaching really is, is making sure I understand what you want. And then I help you guilt there. What I see a lot in dentistry is like, Here, here's how you run a practice. Like, no, that's not, there's as many ways to run a practice as there are dentists. And making sure that the elements are, based on principles and standards that are impossible to argue with. And so that's, as you can tell, I, I speak with it a passion, like it's what makes me come alive, like ability to produce, ability to keep growing and, and pushing, but it's also what unlocks potential in other people. And that's, that's the thing that I get from this work that doesn't involve money, right? Like it's sometimes the, the oh my gosh, I can't believe that I was able to do this as a parent, as a coach, as a, as a employer is better than the actual payoff. And when you can have both like, and you could do it again and again, like it becomes like life becomes so fun at that stage. All right, guys, that'll do it for part one of our interview series with Dr. David Maloney. He uh, had a lot of good things to say about building yourself up, becoming the best person you possibly be professionally and personally. So what you guys can do is, shoot us a follow at dental.soon.vibes. You can always check out our other episodes on your podcast uh, platform and stay tuned for part two. That'll be an awesome, uh, awesome, awesome interview. We uh, really enjoy having Dr. David Moley on. We hope to do a lot of good things with him in the future. And as always, stay safe and vibe on.